So in this video, we're going to continue our survey of different types of biomolecules that make up cells. Today we're talking about proteins, which is a really important chemical worker in the cell doing all of the chemical jobs within the cell. So again, here are our four types of biomolecules. We're on number three now. And uh, just in the first video, I kind of covered what I want you to know from each, but here's just a quick reminder. And so let's dive into proteins. Uh, what I'm showing you here are the building blocks of proteins. Let's go ahead and start there. Amino acids are the repeating unit that you can put together over and over and over to build uh, what will ultimately become a protein, as we'll discuss. I'm actually only showing you five of the 20 common amino acids that make up proteins in this particular picture. Um, this is way too complicated for us, so please don't write down these names or write down or draw these structures. None of that you need to know. Um, mostly I'm just showing you the chemical structures here because I just want you to see the atoms. Um, this is actually written in kind of a shorthand format, unfortunately, so um, every place there's an intersection here is actually a carbon atom. So let me just try and draw in the C's there, and hopefully you can see that just like in, as in carbohydrates and lipids, there is carbon and oxygen and hydrogen. So that's actually going to be common to all four types of biomolecules. But we're finally seeing new atoms on the scene, so nitrogen. That's why we uh, focused on the nitrogen cycle in ecology because uh, organisms need nitrogen for their proteins and as it turns out for their nucleic acids. One way I try to help students re uh, remember that is that the only two biomolecules with the letter N in them are proteins and nucleic acids, the two bio biomolecules that have nitrogen. And as it turns out, some of the amino acids also have sulfur S. Sulfur is going to be unique to proteins. We're going to see that nucleic acids have something else. So um, those are the atoms that make up proteins. And what I really want to emphasize is we don't need to worry too much about the atoms. When we're, uh, we're going to see that proteins are so complicated. We can really just think about the amino acids themselves. And what I like what this uh, picture does is it shows that there are names for these amino acids, but we frequently abbreviate them. And sometimes we even use one letter abbreviations. Because as we're going to see, proteins can be made of hundreds or even thousands of amino acids put together in a particular order. And so what I really want you to think of is it's almost like a, an, an alphabet. There's a 20 amino acid alphabet that we can use to construct protein words, kind of. So let me just give you a quick example from in the English language. We have 26 letters in our English language. And by selecting particular letters and by putting them in a particular order, we can create uh, words of meaning, like, for example, kale. Um, but also, if I were just to rearrange those letters, I'd come up with a completely different word. And so I just want you to see that the, the same is then true of amino acids being used to construct proteins. Here I'm using different colors to represent different amino acids. But again, the order matters. The order in which I put them together will ultimately lead to a very different protein. And here's kind of where the language analogy falls apart. As it turns out, it's even more complicated for proteins because not only are we putting them in a particular order at first, we will kind of put them in a one-dimensional string, um, but eventually they're going to interact with one another and really form a complicated three-dimensional structure. So what makes protein uh, so difficult to study is that um, proteins are three-dimensional, not just a one-dimensional language. This three-dimensionality is extremely important because oftentimes the whole purpose of, of having the protein fold up a certain way is that there might be pockets in the protein where it can fit certain chemicals that have their own unique shape. And that really dictates the protein's job. A protein has a three-dimensional structure so that it can execute a very specific chemical job by being able to fit with a certain pro, uh, chemical. Um, we often, we're going to use the lock and key analogy a little bit later when we cover enzymes, um, but it's almost exactly like a key fits very precisely in a lock. Okay, so let me just show you, um, I'm, I'm going a little bit overboard here, but I just wanted to show you a real life protein. So over here on the left, we have uh, the precise amino acid sequence. Um, it's actually a pretty easy technique now these days to be able to take a protein and determine its amino acid sequence. It's sort of one dimensional uh, string of amino acids that are combined. We can see that this is actually 395 amino acids long, so I just wanted to give you a sense of the complexity there. And over on the right is our attempt to represent that protein three dimensionally. 
Um, so once again, we see that maybe that there's you know, a little bit of a pocket here where maybe some chemical in particular is able to go through that protein or interact with the protein in some kind of way. And I just want to uh, say here that this is a major area of research even in present day. Um, how this uh, string of amino acids translates into a three-dimensional structure really is a major area of study. Um, in fact, here in July 2015, they just kind of proposed in a, in a recent journal um, a structure of one of the proteins that's involved with the HIV virus. Um, that makes doctors and researchers really excited because we think if we really understand what that protein does, maybe we can figure out ways to block it, and that might help um, block uh, HIV from uh, the virus from infecting more people. Okay. Um, so let's just kind of finish the video by talking about two broad types of proteins. Um, there are far more types of proteins than this in cells, but for an introductory course, this is good enough. We're going to talk about enzymes. Uh, enzyme proteins can interact with chemicals and basically help them turn into other chemicals. They speed up the chemical reactions of the chemicals that they bind with. And so here's kind of a cartoon of a chemical fitting very precisely in a very particular type of enzyme that has the shape to fit it. Once they fit together, the enzyme helps the chemical turn into maybe two smaller chemicals. So sometimes enzymes um, cut up the chemicals they interact with. Other enzymes will put together smaller chemicals and then release um, the bigger chemical that they've helped put together. There are also transport proteins, which we're really going to see more next unit. But in brief introduction, they're going to be a really important part of the cell membrane, and they have specific shapes to interact with specific chemicals, just like all proteins, except that unlike enzymes, they don't turn the chemicals they interact with into other chemicals. They just let chemicals through the cell membrane. They're either going to let chemicals into the cell or out of the cell, um, but they're going to be very particular about what they let cross. And so um, that's just a very brief introduction. We tried to talk about the atoms that make up proteins. We tried to really focus on amino acids. Amino acids are the crucial building block of proteins and how we get such a variety of proteins because we can put together those amino acids in many different orders that ultimately lead to proteins with different shapes and they have those shapes to be able to execute very specific chemical jobs.